Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord this morning time. Amen. Amen. We had a great time rejoicing about our King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The Lord is coming and his coming is very near. Amen. And I'm excited to be with you all in the house of the Lord to share from God's word. And um, without spending much time, let's turn to God's word. For that, let's uh, go to Genesis chapter 39, verses 9. And I'm just going to be reading. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. So how could I do this immense evil, and how could I sin against God? Underline the word, how can I sin against God? Let's close our eyes. God, we thank you for this time that you have presented to us, Lord. And we pray that we will be able to utilize this time very efficiently and wisely to equip ourselves and to, and to be ready in the dark days ahead of us, Lord. Speak to us, minister to us, Lord. Um, let my words and my tongue be used as your uh, pencil to write into the hearts of people. Lord, change our hearts and minds, including mine today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, amen. How many of you like Pepsi and Cola here? Soft drink people? Yeah, there you go. So I'm sure there's enough division between the Pepsi world and the Cola world. There are many people who like Pepsi only, Cola only. So if one company had the edge over the other, they would definitely win. But obviously we know that in this free market and capitalistic world, both these markets are competing with each other, which makes both of them do really well every year. So one doesn't slop off, the other one makes sure it outcompetes with the other one. In the 19, uh, 1890s, uh, in the 1980s, is when the Cola Wars began. Uh, it's called the Cola Wars because Pepsi and Cola was at the highest point of fighting with each other in regards of who had the best taste, the best bottle, the best everything. Um, I didn't know about this, but Pepsi and Cola were one company actually. Pepsi-Cola, and then they separated out when their own ways did their whole thing. But um, even today, there's actually a blood feud between these two companies. Uh, they dislike each other. Now imagine if you are a um, very high executive person in Cola Company, right? In Cola Company, and you got that secret formula somehow, stole it, received it, whatever. What would you do with that information? sell it online, read it, I don't know, uh, do something with it because for monetary gains, right? If you sold Cola Secret to Pepsi, you will get what? So much money and do a lot of things, right? So in 2006, uh, a, a top executive by the name of Joya Williams, she did the same thing. She got the secret recipe for Cola, upcoming products, even bottles that were not even sent out to the world to taste yet, she got everything, put her in her purse, and walked out of the Cola's department in Atlanta. Um, with the help of three of her friends, she then emailed Pepsi saying, guess what? I got something. And all you got to give me is $10,000 for the initial recipe and close to $1 million to get the rest of the thing. Guess what Pepsi did, guys? They called the cops on her. Yeah. So... Pepsi called the FBI on Joya Williams, and they did a sting operation and caught uh, Joya Williams and all the other three people. And when people asked, man, why, why would you do that? That's your best chance to get ahead of the team, right? Like, you got all the secret recipe. This is it. This is the end of Cola, Coca-Cola company's career. You could have wiped them out. You could have done so much damage, but... Uh, the, the spokesperson for Pepsi at that said, we were just doing what any responsible company would do, said Pepsi spokesperson. In other words, they were holding on to the integrity and the value of that company. Each one of us will face very, very similar tempting moments of our lives to do something that is so wrong, yet we gain something so out of it, but it will cross our integrity check. If the worldly people got this concept, you have to figure out who told them about this. Who told them about integrity? Where do we understand this idea about doing good? 
I say it is from the Bible, and I'll explain how. So what, is, what does integrity mean, right? Integrity, simple, basic definition is the quality of being honest and, 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 and be having strong moral principles, the state of being whole. So if something, if this paper is in its integrity, but the moment I tear this paper, it loses its integrity because it loses the wholeness. So the meaning of integrity is wholeness. It means having honesty, strong morals, and such sort. So in the Garden of Eden, when God created man, he instilled one of the image qualities of God that is integrity. See, when God created his creation, he said, it is good. Everything is good. Everything in the mankind is good. And mankind was the highest creation of what God did. And he saw that and he said, it's good. Why? It's complete. It's whole. The integrity of human value has been sustained. But obviously, we understand that is called the original integrity because that is the pre-fall or pre-sin integrity. And this image of God is not lost in human beings after fall. But the original integrity of human beings have been lost. This is why we are obviously told to always be honest, which is why we are always told to do good. Why? Because originally, we're not meant to do that. Originally, because of sin, our heart naturally goes into dishonest ways, evil ways, unwhole ways. So the original integrity has been lost, but this integrity has been given back to us Jesus, by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary when he died. How do we know this? 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Just as we have borne the image of man. What is the image of man? Image is the qualities, right? What is the qualities of man? Wickedness, lust, evil, dishonesty, abusiveness. All those image has been transferred. Image of man has been transferred into us. But Paul is saying, but we shall also bear the image of the man on heaven one day. That means we will one day get back that original design that we were meant to. So man by nature had the original integrity from God, which is the wholesomeness, the honesty, the kindness, the goodness. But because of the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden, that has been lost. And now the image of evilness and the image of Satan has been sprinkled throughout. Amen. So God, why do we need to keep our integrity? Why? No one's looking, no one's asking for it, but, but why? There's three reasons for it. One, God designed it. It's God's image. He designed it. And number two, he desires it. And number three, he looks for it in human beings. Let's read 1 Kings 9 verses 4. And as if for you, if you walk before me, David, God is talking to David, as fa- your father walked with, uh, to Solomon, integrity, of heart and uprightness, doing according to what I've commandment and keeping my statutes of my rules. God basically gives Solomon a promise to bless him, to honor him, keep him truth. If he holds on to the values, the integrous values that his father David has kept. So one, God designed integrity. Number two, God desires integrity in everyone. And number three, God looks for it. Let's go to Psalms 5, verse 51, verse 6. Surely you desire integrity in inner self, and you teach me the wisdom deep within. Even in our darkest, deepest moments, God looks for integrity. Okay, so why should we keep our integrity? Because God designed it. That's the original image that God has bared. Number two, God desires it. And number three, God looks for it in every man. Okay, but for what do I need to have this integrity, you may ask. Why? What, for what reason should I have? There's three, two basic reasons. One is to walk in the path of righteousness, right? Proverbs 11 verses 3 says, The integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. So first reason, why? So that you get to walk in the path of righteousness. Number two. Why, for what reason do you need to have integrity in your life? Number two, so that no one will condemn you. Guess who said this quote? I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Who said that? Mahatma Gandhi said that. We forgot to bear the image of Christ in our walks. When I say we, I don't talk about us. I talk about Christian people in general. We sometimes have failed to bear integrity, to bear honesty, to bear the likeness of our God in our walks of our day-to-day lives. Hence, causing other people to not like this whole idea of Christianity. Remember, dear children of God, for what should you hold on to integrity? Number two, so that other people won't condemn you. 
See, Titus 2, verses 7, it says, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing else evil to say about us. Why do you need integrity? Because people around you are watching how a Christ follower is behaving, even when no one is looking. We as Christians sometimes think, well, I'm the same as him, so I get to do the same thing. No, the world is watching very secretly, and when the opportunity arises, they will condemn you. And when they condemn you, they're not condemning you theoretically, they're condemning God because of your actions, because of your dis the breaking of your integrity causes abomination to God's name. So dear children of God, I want to remind you once again, for what do you need to hold on to integrity? Number one, it's because it's the path of righteousness that God wants. Number two, it's so that you will not be condemned by the world or with the world. Remember in the first example, right? In the first example, what did that Williams get? She got jail time. So integrity, if you don't hold up, withhold integrity, even in the worldly standards, you will get in trouble. You will get punishment according to the law that is required. Then how much more will the heavenly king of kings and the Lord of lords deserve to punish us? You know, we, we Christians always sometimes think, well, it's okay, the Lord forgives. Yeah, but the Lord forgives is what you think. But if the worldly law punishes you for it, how much more will an eternal king who made all these rules will condemn you one day for this if you don't repent. Don't look at other people and, and, and determine integrity. That's a very wrong thing to do. I know a lot of Christian leaders these days have fallen in their marriage and their walks with the Lord. Their integrity has been broken. Those are all reasons why it is high importance for us in our today's world to hold up to the integrity in our marriage, our workplace, our job, our relationship with the Lord. Our integrity as Christians need to be at the utmost high in today's day and age when the Christian leaders are falling left and right because they broke that honesty, that truthfulness, and the wholeheartedness. So here's another one. Uh, why, uh, how can we keep integrity? There are many people in the Bible that I want to talk about, but Due to time constraints, I'm going to pick two. Ready? The first person is Joseph. Everybody knows about Joseph. The, the story of Joseph is found in Genesis 39, which is from where we read today's um, little glimpse about. So J verses 39 is a, is a story where Joseph is in Potiphar's house. But before that, let's take a look at Joseph's life, right? So in his childhood, he was his father's favorite kiddo. He uh, got the special clothes. He was good looking and fit. And he was also a snitch. His brothers didn't like him because he was basically a snitch. Number two, many of us in our childhood, you are probably the favorite child of your parents. You might be the most loved person, but you might be also a snitch. Not a good behavior. I don't think snitching is a good idea. But you can stand up for what is truth in a graceful manner. Snitching is different from standing up for what is truth. Snitching is in the intention to get somebody in trouble. We don't do that as Christians. You can stand, rightfully stand up for truth and try to correct them in a graceful manner. So Joseph was all of these things about favorite kiddo, and his family was not the best. I'm not talking about us, but a lot of us don't have good family structures. His family also had issues. Twelve brothers, eleven brothers, and not all from the same mother. There's a little chart over there that basically says Jacob had four wives, no, the Bible does not uh, tell you to go and marry four women. The Bible did not support this idea, but that happened because of evilness and sinfulness of Jacob. And he definitely, even today, we all pay a price for all those sins that our forefathers have done. So, Joseph's family was not the best, right? He had four wives. He had stepbrothers, stepsisters, stepmoms, all the stuff. He had dysfunctional family. The Bible actually re recounts a story in Genesis 37, where 37 verses 4, it says, when his, brothers, um, when his brothers saw that his father loved him more, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peacefully to him. Can you imagine eating dinner at a table with all your 11 brothers? They hate you so much. The, the next time you ask, can you pass me one extra chapati? I'd be like, no, man. Go get your own. Right? He was hated. He had the most dysfunctional family. The amount of mental torture and trauma this kid could have gone through. I'm trying to relate to our world today, okay? Because a lot of people, when they commit a mistake, they say, it's my childhood trauma. It's the way that I was brought up. It's my family. 
I agree. I understand. Look, Joseph was not in the best family ever. He also had problems. He also grew up with stepmom, stepbrothers, stepsisters. He also had a dysfunctional family. And when the time was right, Joseph always knew that the Lord was with him. You might be that person, uh, you know, who always has something from the Lord. You know that's not right. You know the Lord told you to do such a thing. But when you go and try to tell it to your friends, they'll be like, you're a weirdo. Man, you're a Jesus freak. We don't, we don't, you know what? Let's not talk anymore. It's okay. Joseph knew that the Lord was with him. And the Bible always kept saying that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Dear child of God, in college, in school, you might be that only person who's totally different and sometimes hears the word of God and you're like, man, I got to live a life this way. And you're like, no, but others are not believing. It's okay. If the scripture says so, if God tells you to do so, do it because the Lord is with you in what you do. It's okay if people hate you for standing up to what is right. It is okay if people make fun of you for believing what the word of God says because the Lord is with you. So as Joseph grew up, as Joseph grew up, he had a lot of tragedies in his life. Like, think about it. He was sold by his own brothers. There's no much, so much trauma this guy has gone through in his life. So much trauma, right? A guy who was loved, who was handsome, who had every favor of his fa father was sold by his own brothers. And now when life came up to him, he's now in charge. I don't want to spend more time on Joseph. He's now in charge of Potiphar's house. Potiphar is like a general guard uh, of the Pharaoh, so this guy was top of the top line. And God's favor was upon Joseph that even Potiphar trusted everything in his household except his wife. You should not trust your wife with other people, dear men and dear women. You should not trust your spouses with other people. That's just a biblical principle. So Potiphar basically kept everything and everybody else away. Uh, um, only, only the wife was away from Joseph. Suddenly, almost every day, this woman would come and taunt this man, this young, handsome man, to kind of get into a sexual relationship with him. In life, dear child, you might sometimes be walking life normally and fine, and boom, all of a sudden, you're just tempted with the most wrong thing of life. You must be engaged in some relationship now. You must have watched something. You would have heard something. You started talking something. All of a sudden... You were a totally godly man until some point of your life, just like how Potiphar's wife enticed Joseph, there's some enticement that must have happened in your life. For men, I can tell you, for men and women, pornography is one of the biggest things that catches men and women at the same rate. Somebody would have introduced that to you. Somebody or some way or form you must have been hooked on. That's how Joseph was, right? He was enticed by Potiphar's wife. But Joseph had all the right in the world to say, man, I've been abused, I've been traumatized, I have a lot of baggage in my life, my parents are not with me, my brothers are not with me, nobody's there with me, let's go Potiphar's wife. Is that what he did? No. Read Genesis 39 verses 9 again. No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how could I do this? immense evil and how could I sin against God I don't know what kind of enticement you are going through in life right now I don't know if you're in the early phase of this enticement or if you're playing with this sin or you're having fun with this sin or you're trying to get out of this sin but you can't but just know that how how do you maintain your integrity in such a circumstance you should ask you should ask uh, Joseph this and he would tell you he acknowledges that the eye of the Lord is present everywhere, seeing both the good and evil. He recognized that. Dear child of God, whether you do something in incognito mode, whether you do something in, in your closed doors, whether you listen to something that you're not supposed to listen to, does not forbid the eyes and the ears of the Lord from reaching, seeing, and perceiving it. Do not fool yourselves by thinking that the Lord is not watching or the Lord is not listening. My wife and I were talking about something yesterday. Growing up, we had mentors in our life that said, if you watched a movie and Jesus was sitting right next to you, would you continue watching that movie? If you were with a woman or a man and Jesus was sitting right next to you, would you behave in such a way to her? If Jesus was watching your marriage, would you have treated him or her that way? We and I sometimes neglect the idea that God is not there. God is not watching because he's not presently there. 
But the Bible clearly states the presence of the Lord, omnipresent God. That is the beauty of our God. Amen. I'm so excited when I talk about our God. We don't, we, our God is not just carried in little idols or little mountains or boxes. Our God is present everywhere. His eyes are going in and out, whether you recognize it or not. So, First reason, why was Joseph able to keep his integrity even when he had all the rights in the world to say, I'm hurt, I have a lot of baggage in my life, I have trauma, I have PTSD, I have this, I have that, and my parents are not here, I don't know what it feels like, she, she enticed me anyway, so let me engage. Why? why? Why did he stop and say, no, no, I can't do it, why? The first thing is acknowledging that the eyes of the Lord are there. Dear, my, dear child, child of God, let me ask you, a lot of us slow down when we see a cop, right? You might be speeding on 100, including myself. But the moment you see something that looks like a cop, flashes like a cop, you slow down so quickly. Why? Because visibly you saw it and you got a reminder in your heart. See, we and you and I, including myself, commit these atrocities and sin because we don't see a physical God present. But the Bible is reminding us, acknowledge that no matter what you say in secret, no matter what you see in secret, no matter what you do in secret, the Lord is watching. The Lord is watching. I'm not a saint, but I'm trying to say is that any time that I felt the guilty conscience of the Holy Spirit, it's because the, my, my soul is being reminded that the Lord saw what you just did. The Lord just saw what you thought in your heart about her or him. The Lord really heard that conversation that you thought nobody else was going to listen to. So the first step in how to maintain your integrity is acknowledge that the presence of the Lord is here. There's a difference between acknowledging something and recognizing something. Acknowledging means admitting to. Recognize means it's just to know it's there. Today, move on from the idea that, yeah, I recognize God is everywhere, to acknowledge that the Lord is really, really there wherever you are. Admit to that fact. Understand that fact. Take that into your heart. It will prevent a lot of mishaps that we could do in the future. So number two, I want you to understand that when you commit an atrocity or when you break your integrity, your moral character, your wholeness from God, you are in direct violation with God, which is what Joseph basically was saying. Hey, Potiphar's wife, I get it. In your eyes, you're just committing a sin in front of Potiphar, your husband, or uh, whatever, right? That, that's, that's, you only see dimensionally, like one dimensional. But for me, Potiphar's wife, guess what? I see two, 3D, like a God who is vert vertically above me, a God that is watching me. You don't see that God, but I'm telling you, he's there, and which is why we can't engage in what we're about to do. Dear child of God, the next time when you're enticed to do something so wrong, when you are trapped in a place where you didn't even expect to be trapped, but now you're like, yeah, it feels good. It's okay, let's do it. Remember the Lord is watching. Remember the eyes of the Lord is watching. If you are in an abusive relationship, mentally, physically, spiritually, if you're in an abusive relationship, know that the Lord is watching. The perpetrator might just feel like oh, I'm, I'm, I'm abusing him or her because nobody else is watching. No, I'm telling you, the Lord is watching. And when you do such atrocities, you are committing a direct violation against Yahweh, the creator of your life, the one who desires integrity, the one who looks for integrity. You are in direct violation with the Lord Almighty. My time is running out, so let's, let's just go ahead quickly. How do we keep uh, running with our integrity, right? We keep seeing this. Je um, Genesis 39, verses 12. He left his garment in our hand and fled and got out of the house. Dear child of God, when you're playing around with sin, don't be like, well, you know what? I'll just wait for it to be done with. I'll just... Just wait for him or her to end this relationship. I'll, I'll wait for somebody to come along my way and say this is wrong. No, certain circumstances require you to run. Run. I know the Bible says in James 4 verses uh, 7, Submit yourself, therefore resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Don't flee in circ circumstances. Don't, don't, don't try to, uh, fl for example, if, 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 if uh, Joseph stood there with Potiphar's wife, be like, yeah, I'm going to resist, uh, I'm going to resist, I'm going to resist. No, no. The answer to that is run. Use wisdom in certain places of your life, whether you have to run from the evil or to resist the devil. There has to be two things that always happens in your life. If something checks up with your integrity, if something does not feel in your heart right, do two of these things. Run from it and resist it. Run from it, resist it. Remember, how do you maintain your integrity? Run from the evil things. Resist it. 
run from it, and resist it. Okay, do you feel like people that talk to you down is, is really hurting your mental, emotional, spiritual life? Run from them. Do you feel like that woman that you're talking to, the guy that you're talking to is kind of getting out of line? Run from them. Don't wait for it to get any better. Run from it. Do, are you watching something that is suggestive of something that is not appropriate? Turn it off and run from it. Don't wait and pray for God, give me the resistance. No, no, run from it. Turn it off, run from it. Dear child of God, don't toy around, don't tinker with sin. If you, if you feel like it's sin, if you sense that it is sin, run away from it. Because guess what? Very soon, very soon, you will be ensnared by it. In the Bible, in the Bible there is a verse that says, um, uh, Hebrews 12, verses 14, it says, oh, 1 to 4, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight which clings on so closely. The sin that entices you, the Potiphar's wife, it clings on to you, man. Before you know it, you're already in the bed. You've already destroyed your, your commitment with the Lord. You've destroyed your integrity. You have committed that mistake. But the Bible is calling us and saying, run from it. But I can assure you something. The Bible is always talking about restoration and healing in our heart. It's okay. You messed up in your integrity. You messed up in the way that you have dealt with others, your wife, your spouse, your kids. You have not kept up to your morality. It's okay. First John not one verse nine says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. You know what's so unique about Christianity is that we serve a God who forgives, a God who heals, a God who restores, a God who is relational, a God who understands. There is no other God in this world, I challenge you, that can have all these qualities. And we are asked to exhibit those image qualities of God. Praise God. You might be thinking, uh, man, I have messed up. I did this. I did that. The Lord is near to you more than now than ever. The Lord loves you still. The Lord is still saying, it's okay, dear son and daughter. I saw what you saw. I heard what you heard. I feel what you felt. I know what happened to you. Come to me for restoration and healing. Have you fallen in keeping your integrity, your morality, your spiritual life? Seek God, open yourself up to an elder or a spiritual leader so that together you can walk in the path of integrity and glorify God. I want all eyes closed this uh, morning time as the worship team comes ahead. Why do we need to keep our integrity? Because that's the way God designed us before the fall. After fall, we as humans have a tendency to go back and break the integrity, the wholeheartedness the morality of God. The Lord is looking tonight, this morning time, in each one of our hearts. How many of you have broken that integrity? You might be currently in a relationship. You might be talking to somebody. You might be watching something. You might be hearing something. You might be speaking something that breaks that moral code that God has given. And if your heart is pricked this morning time, just ask the Lord to forgive, restore, heal, and clean. Because he's looking for a heart that has integrity, that can uphold to the standards of God. Dear children of God, just because nobody's watching you as you're going back to college, as I understand, your parents are probably not going to be there. Your brothers, your sisters might not be there to keep an eye out for you just to say if it's right or wrong. The college parties, the relationships that you'll get into, don't do it. Because the Lord is really watching you. You might feel like because the light was turned dim, because the music was so loud, because you put your phone on silent, because, because of, because of, because of, because no, the Lord is there with you, brother, sister, especially, especially if you professed to say that I have decided to follow Jesus. The Lord is with you. Joseph recognized that, and that's how he was able to maintain his integrity. This morning time, God, we once again ask you to restore our hearts. If we dealt with somebody or we dealt with something that was not up to your standard of holiness, of your standard of morality, of your standard of integrity, God, we ask you to restore that image in our hearts. Help us to always reflect who Jesus is and help us to always love you and serve you and run the race and to run away from evil at every given time. We thank you for your provision and for mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask and we plead. Amen, amen, amen.